All right, we're going to continue with our next session, which is freestyle travel, a conversation with two globe-trotting nomads. These two extraordinary men have traveled the world like few people ever have, and they have incredible stories to share. John Early, author of Tales of the Modern Nomad, is an award-winning writer based out of his hometown of Saskatoon, although he is currently calling Nicaragua his second home. He and his backpack have been to more than 30 countries around the world for a decade of travel. Mike Spencer Bone has been backpacking the world his entire adult life. He was born in Ottawa and raised in Ontario, Nova Scotia, Alberta, and British Columbia before skipping out of Canada entirely and backpacking the world for 26 years and counting. His brand new just published book is The World's Most, Most Traveled Man, a 23-year odyssey to and through every country on the planet. Please welcome John Early and Mike Spencer Bone. All right, a very good afternoon, Saskatoon. And a big thank you to the Word on the Street Festival for, uh, for inviting us here. And uh, I'm really excited for, uh, for this, this talk coming up. Um, uh, I mean, for, for anyone that's a travel junkie like myself or that, that enjoys traveling, uh, we've got a bit of an icon here. So um, we've got Mike Spencer Bound, who's been to 195 countries, depending on, on which, which ones you count, every, every country, every place. And uh, over 26 years, that's, that's pretty incredible. And uh, so I'm, I'm really excited to jump in the conversation here. And yes, uh, my, my new book out, uh, Tales of the Modern Nomad, Monks, Mushrooms, and Other Misadventures, uh, goes over my, my last 10 years of doing some travels and uh, covering the more so the misadventures of traveling, not the, not the stuff you'll find in the guidebook, the, the sunny, politically correct stuff, but the kind of the, the, the things that you encounter that you're not always expecting, but you can learn from, and even the, some of the spiritual and, and psychedelic journeys as well. And, uh, but but I'll, I'll kick things off by, by welcoming, Mike, welcome to Saskatoon. You've been to a lot of places in the world, but uh, here you are in the Paris of the Prairies, so, so welcome. It's good to be here. Yeah. yeah so we Speak right into the mic okay. there. Okay, yeah, it's good to be here. I was kind of wondering before I got here if I'd been here before, because I used to crisscross with my parents going across the whole continent chasing the sun during summer times, and I know I stopped in a lot of these prairie cities, but I think it's actually my first time here. Yeah, it's quite a good city. Perfect. So tell us a little bit about your travel philosophy, Mike, because uh, uh, it's, it's not exactly the most common thing for someone to grow up in Canada and then to, and then to decide to travel to every country in the world. So tell us a little bit about your, your travel philosophy. Okay, well, I had kind of a strange travel philosophy because I... Like a lot of people are afraid of traveling to uh, many countries in Africa or Asia or South America because they're worried that they're a third world. But I was used to a fourth world sort of existence in Canada. Because when I was very young and even into, a little bit into my early 20s, I used to live alone in the wilderness, just living off the land you know, by fishing and hunting and picking berries. And quite often I'd go 90 days or sometimes even longer without speaking or speaking to or seeing another human. So, you know, I was used to all kind of encounters with bears. I had a mountain lion try to kill me once. And, you know, I was used to all this wilderness. And when I got out traveling, I found these third world countries it was a step up from the fourth world I was used to. <laughs> yeah, and I developed a strong stomach as well from that. So, you know, it's, it really helps. So I, I was almost disease free. So it's been 26 years of travel now. And I only got, I think I got, I got two malarias for sure of the falsoparum, which is the lethal type. But I, I managed to sort of head them off with some coartin before they got me. And a whole bunch of Giardias. It's hard to avoid getting that every year or two. And I think I might have had Zika once when I was crossing Micronesia. Because I've actually never been to a hospital. But I nearly went to a hospital in Micronesia. Because I felt some kind of a strange fever and a bunch of symptoms that were really unfamiliar to me. And so I tried to go to a hospital, but it was closed. And it was New Year's anyway, and it was raining. And I went back, and eventually the fever faded. But then I was reading in the, in the news that Zika had just been crossing through Micronesia at that time. So it could have been a Zika. <laughs> there we yeah, go. But other than that, that's not many diseases, really, for you know, all that time. So, yeah, well, I guess yeah, growing up and uh, being outside and trying to avoid civilization is a good, good way to, to prepare yourself for going into some very isolated, yeah, for difficult sure. and travel especially countries. There's a lot of very large, dangerous animals in some of these countries. So I've had like, a few run-ins with elephants. And, uh, you know, the crocodiles, things like that. So <laughs> be being used to bears really helped me. Yeah. Especially with wild forest elephants, you really have to throw up your arms and kind of scare them away or else they'll charge. And it's sort of similar to what you do when you get bear trouble. 
Have you ever crossed a, a hippo? I've heard hippo, hippopotamuses are the, the most, some of the most dangerous animals. Yeah, they're, they're really dangerous, but I, every time I was near hippos, I had really, really good guides. And they, they were terrified of hippos. So they were able to just listen for that little grunting they make in the distance, and they'd make sure that I skirted the area where I might get attacked. Right. But yeah, a lot of people do. They're, they're quite a dangerous animal. Yeah. I, something you write in your book that I, that I like, which is, which is out now, The World's Most Traveled Man. It's, uh, does, it's not out for another couple of weeks officially, but there are some copies here. Uh, which is cool, but you, you likened a traveler to being like a bicycle, that it functions the best when it's always set in motion. And I find that's, I find that's a really, really perfect analogy, because I know for myself it's, it kind of, you keep getting engaged and you find more reasons to keep, keep going. And uh, is, is that what's, what's kept, you, kept you motivated, kept you, kept you running, is, uh, is traveling? It's been your, been your main motivation to just seek yeah, and learn? It, it could have been part of my motivation. I mean, I have to admit to being extraordinarily interested in new things when I was younger. So, like, when I first did my, my first real trip where it was a little bit dodgy was down to Central America. And I remember just looking at palm trees or a special kind of lizard I'd never seen before, and I, I was just so interested in these things. And even a lot of the other travelers were kind of like, oh, whatever, a lizard or palm trees, a beach, whatever. You know, they, they weren't as interested in it. But I was, uh, you know, almost obsessed with these new things. And that carried on for decades. And now, of course, I've seen all the ecosystems, all the rivers, all the mountains, you know, example of everything. So I, I'm having to find different motivations. I'm more interested in the people and the cultures now. Right. You, you write in your book about um, the cheapest hotel that you ever paid for was in Nicaragua. You paid... Three cents? Yeah, it was a three cent hotel. You three don't find those anymore. Night. Yeah, back in the day, you used to be able to get some real deals. But, but this one... <laughs> but I was actually... I was traveling with two women, and we'd gone up to this woman who was renting a hotel in Nicaragua. And this was just after the war, so early 90s. And we're asking her how much the room was. And she, she told us, and we translated it and figured out what it was. And it was going to be three cents each for the suite we were renting. And we just burst out laughing. And then she became incredibly suspicious because she's wondering, why weren't we trying to bargain her down from her first offer? Instead, we were just laughing about it. So she, she thought we were going to do a runner. So she insisted on the money up front before she gave us the key. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, but in a way, you get what you pay for. So it was like the beds were burlap sacks full of straw. It turned out one, one, one of the girls, a Swedish woman, she snored. <laughs> there were like a festival. Of course, there's always a festival going on outside. Nicaragua of is one of the loudest countries I've <laughs> yeah. ever been to, that's for sure. I've, I've actually been living there off and on the last four and a half years. Let me tell you, there's no more three-cent hotel rooms there anymore. It's uh, the, new, the new hot spot, I think, for, for Canadians, people to go down south to. But definitely the loudest place I've ever, I've ever been to. The two weeks leading up before Christmas, um, there's fireworks going off at all times, firecrackers. They'll start parades. I bet four, four in the morning, all the families and everyone's out, and the church is giving out fireworks for everyone to, to, to blast off and uh, to fend away the, the evil spirits and, and to welcome in uh, Mary and, and Joseph. So um, very, very cool. And, but again, uh, you were there right after, I guess, right after the, the yeah, Civil there War. Yeah, there weren't many other tourists. Not there. many tourists yeah, was, after there now. Yeah, everything was really cheap. But yeah. you were living in, did you go living in San Juan del Sur? That's the place I've been calling home for sure. Yeah, the surfer place. Yeah, when I was there, there was no hotels, no development, no tourists. But uh, I guess it's probably changed now because if you were there surfing. Yeah, so it's, it's definitely changed now. As, as I guess that's, that's part of the thing with traveling, I guess, too, is you, you discover some of these amazing gems in places knowing that, you know, in five or ten years it's going to be kind of a, a, a typical tourist town or, or whatever. Do you have any other experiences of places that... You've, you've gone through and you're like, ah, I, I know this place is going to be totally different in 10 years. Well, you know, what? there's actually a best time to visit a place. So, so sometimes there's not enough tourist development. Like, for instance, Sumatra right. in the early 90s. They didn't have any development of, you know, there's no ability to go rafting or to see the orangutans or anything like that. They were just like locals who had no idea what a tourist would want. It'd be hard to even get food. And then gradually they developed more of that. And probably it was at its peak for visiting maybe between about 95 and, and uh, 2005, and then of course it goes over touristed, and sometimes it dips back down again. So you really have to watch. You need like a time and a place to. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, travel is a bit like uh, being in a time machine. I mean, I know, I know, like historians wouldn't want to look at it this way, but it kind of is in a way. Like I, I was in Burma once in, I think it was 95, might have been a little bit later, but I was in a, a village where they still had a horse and carriage, like a stagecoach, carrying people around the village. And it wasn't because they expected tourists to look and say, oh, a stagecoach and horses. You know, they would, they would wonder at that sort of activity because from their point of view, that was how you got around. 
So they, they, you know, it's just uh, sometimes you're looking at things that are a hundred years in the past. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, even in Nicaragua right now, they still have ox ox carts pulling pulling people, and then you'll have uh, you got just that big change of the, the rich Monaguans from the capital, and then the, the poor the poor locals as well. So. Do you have any other examples of places that are, have that really extreme high and low of, of, uh, of, of poverty to, to wealth? Well, okay, there's been some changes like that, but I'm thinking most about uh, Vietnam, where just the, their friendliness to tourists seems to modulate. Right. It's very odd. So when they first opened up to tourism after about 1990, they were very friendly toward any foreigner they'd see. Then they, they became kind of extremely greedy and nasty for a while. Now, of course, we're just talking about the small part of the population that serves tourists. And then they sort of became uh, nice again. And now, according to people I'm talking to, they've gone back to nasty. So they're a little bit odd like that. They, they can't decide what their attitude is toward the foreigners visiting their country. And I, I remember a little trick they were doing on the border. So I come across to Cambodia, and I was waiting in this long line to try to uh, get a visa stamp to get in. And w while waiting in the heat and everyone's sweaty and kind of grumpy, there was a young Vietnamese guy who was dressed like a backpacker with a backpack, walking along and engaging people in conversation. And he was trying to ask people what they thought of the government of Vietnam and, and their general opinion of the politics of the region. And I was a little bit suspicious when he started talking to me in that manner, because usually um, Asian people from Vietnam are not so forward like that. So I said only nice things about the Vietnamese government. And it turned out it was a good thing I did, because when I, when I came in to see who was stamping my visa, it was him behind the desk. <laughs> So, so he was scoping out everyone's attitude. And anyone who said anything bad about Vietnam, they were barred from the country. Yeah. I guess being a, a big traveler, a question you always get, the first question is your favorite country. Now, I'm not going to ask you your favorite country, but I know there definitely is uh, some, some countries that are a lot more authentic and a lot more whole to themselves. Uh, I, I know Thailand is one of those countries that it's got its own language, it's got its own uh, Sanskrit, uh, its own currency and, and cuisine, and its own king. So it's really kind of whole into itself, and, and so it's, you, you go there and it's, you're really experiencing Thailand. And one of those reasons, I guess, is that um, Thailand was never colonized by uh, a, a, foreign, a foreign empire. It's the only country in Southeast Asia that, that hasn't been like that. Now, what are some other countries that you find that you've been to that are just really whole and authentic to themselves? Well, to answer that question directly, I'd say Pakistan. Because everybody thinks that Pakistan is going to be extremely problematic and, and warlike and everything else. But you get in there and find that, that people are incredibly friendly. And sometimes you take a taxi drive somewhere and the taxi wouldn't even take money. And people just invite you into the house to stay for free. And there was, there was only one... Tra so there's very few travelers there. And we'd all met each other because we were going through the same guest houses. So there, there might have been 10 or 20 people traveling there. And there's only one woman who got herself in trouble. That was a Chinese woman. And she insisted on going right near the Afghan border and taking a lot of photos. And uh, she got shot. I think she might have survived. But, but other than that, there was uh, nothing, uh, nothing untoward <laughs> happened to anyone. <laughs> I, can, I can see the years of travel have uh, really kind of deadened your... <laughs> your <job laughs> personal. Well, the thing Maybe is... Maybe that's just going through India eight times is uh, one of those things as well. Yeah, well, I, I had a story once from India where I'd been traveling with um, a girlfriend for about eight months. And we were near Mamalapuram and walking north on the beach, and we saw this dead sea turtle. And we're like, oh no, a dead sea turtle, that's so sad. And then we walked a little bit further, and we saw a dead fisherman on the beach. And we just walked right past him and kept walking, because you see so many dead bodies at that time in India. And then after a few minutes, we said, hey, this isn't right. And we're like, oh no, we've been in India too long. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so <laughs> we had to move on to a different country. <laughs> so there are approximately 300 other people in the world, you were saying, that have claimed to have been to every country in the world. And uh, I know you talk about it in, in your book a bit, of, you call them more so uh, country counters and, and feats of transportation versus people that are uh, authentically interested in a, in, a, in a genuine experience meeting uh, local people. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more about, about uh, yeah, the, if, the if world of this world of people that are... Yeah, if I could, I'd like to shift country counters or stamp collectors, they use both words for themselves, off the use of the word travel. Because it's a little bit unfortunate that they, um, they're, they're sort of occupying a lot of the airtime for potential radio interviews or for people that are being celebrated in newspapers. And they're actually just people that are getting off an airplane, taking a selfie, getting back on the plane and flying. Like, like here's an example from Eritrea. 
I had been touring the country for a bit and saw many things, and then finally I was in the airport about to fly out, uh, mostly because the government wouldn't allow me to see anything further. They're kind of like the North Korea of Africa, so it's really hard to get permission to do anything. But there was a woman there who was, she was French, but she might have been from Canada, and she sort of called me over because I was the only other traveler. She wanted a bit of a chat. And I said, oh, wow, I didn't know there was any other tourists in Eritrea right now. And I said, well, uh, did, you, did you have a good time? Like, did you go to see the magic baobab? And she said, no. And I said, well, did you see the last uh, forest in the Horn of Africa? No. And I said, well, did you see the ancient ruins? No. The uh, Art Deco architecture? No. And I said, well, well, what did you see? And she said, well, nothing. I stayed in my hotel room. And then, you know, after taking a taxi from the plane, and now I'm taking a taxi back to the plane. So I was trying to think of something nice to say. <laughs> so I, I really thought hard, and I said, well, at least you enjoyed the Eritrean food. And she said, I didn't have to eat any. I saved food from the plane, and then I unpacked it in my room, and I, uh, <laughs> and I ate it there. And she said, yeah, and I'm almost finished the world. I have 176 countries finished. And I, you know, I didn't say this to her, but I was thinking privately, like, I, I don't think that that's really, <laughs> that's not really travel, you know, if eating airplane food in your hotel room. Yeah, but yeah, there's a lot of them. So there's 300 now that have uh, seen all the countries. But for me, why it took so long, and I'm so incredibly slow compared to the other people who saw all the countries, is that I would go to each country and, you know, properly look around and try to have some sort of adventure or some sort of story, and talk to the locals, all of that. And it takes a long time to do that. And so when, when did that shift? Because I know uh, myself, I've, I've traveled a lot. I, for, for myself, I consider it a lot of traveling, over 30 countries, but you've definitely got that beat. But uh, a lot of times... Um, for, for myself, it's, it's just trying to find new ways to continue the traveling going. But wh when did it click in your head that, hey, this might be achievable of going to every country in the world, and it shifted into, into that versus just uh, continuing traveling? Well, I kind of had a varying opinion as to how feasible it was to see every country. Because when I first started out, you know, I, I had this idea, like, yeah, I'd like to see everything on Earth. It's so interesting. But then I'd noticed that years had gone by, and then I'd look at what tiny part of the world I'd managed to see in that time, and I'd think, oh, okay, it's not even possible. But then I enjoyed travel so much, I'd just keep going. And then after a while, I might find that I'd, I'd done an entire continent or I, I had like another large swath or big country was seen. And I think, oh, maybe it is possible. And so this went on for a while until about after 16 years, I thought, okay, it looks like I can finish it. And uh, it turned out it was only another um, seven years past that. Yeah, but, uh, but of course, it turned out that maybe my goal was not to see all the countries because after I finished them, I just kept on going. So it's been, yeah, it's been another, another three or four years now. So I, I was just, uh, just came from the Black Sea region. I was out in uh, southern Ukraine, hanging out with some friends. Actually in an industrial city, but I'd never seen it before, so it was quite fun. And so I guess the inevitable question would be, uh, how do you sustain traveling? How do you, what, what jobs have you had? Because I personally as well, you, you sometimes jump from one job to the next, and, uh, and sometimes you, you have to take jobs you may or may not uh, appreciate, but... Uh, uh, mm. Sounds like you've had some more interesting experiences with uh, taking advantage of maybe some currency crashes and, and uh, doing some more importing, exporting. Yeah, I've actually, I've never worked, not since I was a kid. You know, when I was a kid, I would take jobs putting up scaffolding or doing construction work to get some extra money, you know, around school. Yeah. But once I started traveling, what I would do instead is wait for opportunities for arbitrage. So when something's not the price that it should be. Because, uh, you know, very often you have a collapsing currency or you have um, some sort of product that's actually really, really nice, but they, um, it's not really finding a market for itself. And if I ever noticed something like that, I would uh, take advantage and import it into North America and often get quite a good markup. So here would be an example. In Scotland, I noticed a, um, a box that was perhaps what you put in a window cell for geraniums, made of wood with a really nice stylized design of uh, heathers and berries on it. And it was 1,000 years old and had been preserved in a peat marsh. And when I saw that, oh, interesting. So I, you know, I got some postcards of it from different angles. <laughs> and then I kept that with me. And then when I was in Asia, I noticed there was a place where the uh, currency had dropped by 90% in value because of the Thai bot crisis. So this was the Indonesian rupiah that had dropped. And I talked to a manufacturer there and said, how much would it cost to do perfect runoffs of this ancient artifact? And he, said, he looked at it and he said, I'll make a sample and see how hard it is. He goes, yeah, we can do that for seven bucks. And I said, ooh, great. Well, I want thousands of them. So, I, you know, I used to carry around a, a blue bag. In fact, that same blue bag there. So I've been carrying that my whole life. But it, when I was younger, I used to have it all full of money. And I was looking just for an opportunity for some sort of business like that. So I gave him some, some money down to, uh, to get the wood ready. And then I traveled for months as he was, you know, getting him, his family and extended family from the whole uh, valley working on these things. 
And finally, I came back, got them loaded in a container and sent. And then while that was crossing the ocean, I'm traveling, of course. So, so far, I've done about a week of work. And then back in Canada, I just went and wholesaled it. And I sold it for six times what I uh, got it for. So $42. <laughs> There so yeah, so one thing like that, you know, that would carry me for four or five years because I work really cheap, or I live really cheap. So I'm looking for the dollar hotel rooms or the three dollar hotel rooms. You know, right, but in, instead of continue on with that business and trying to continuously make money, you'd make a bit of money and then shift it into traveling for a few yeah, more yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a terrible businessman. <laughs> so I'm good at spotting a business opportunity, but then once I get a pile of money, I'm like, ooh, a dog choking pile of cash, right? And then I just live off that in cheap hotels or, or seeing sites and, you know, going down rivers and through jungles. And then, like, after a few years have passed, I'm like, oh, no, my money's getting low again. And then I have to start looking around, and I remember, oh, there's something I saw back then that I might, might be able to make some money on, then I'll rush back and do that. And so this book is kind of my latest scheme as well. <laughs> I'll run out of money again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and actually, I have a tooth I need to have looked at, and I, I didn't, want to, didn't want to get it looked at in the third world, so I might have to get it looked at there in Canada. There we go. So, Bu yeah, buy, so buy Mike's book so he can get his teeth fixed <laughs> yeah. and then continue on in the jungle again. Yeah, because my teeth are pretty broken up from rocks in the rice. It's a problem around the world, right? If you're eating uh, cheap food, there's often, like, their sieves aren't so good, so there's often rocks in the rice. It smacks, uh, smashes pieces off teeth. Yeah. But anyway... I want, to, I want to talk about the, the bond between travelers because I know that's something that um, when you meet other people traveling when you're overseas, you have a different bond with them. Like if you, are, if you were to start a conversation uh, at a bus stop here, uh, it would be totally different than the conversation you'd have um, on the other side of the world in a foreign environment. You find another English speaker and you get really excited and you, you kind of uh, connect right away. I, I call it accelerated friendships when you're, you're, you're kind of thrown into things and you're, you realize that you have to kind of get each other's back and then you, and then, uh, you end up being best friends for the night or, or, or sharing meals and things without even maybe knowing their name and then you might never see them again after. But um, I, I guess I've got an, an example. Uh, my first trip to Asia, I flew into, and flew into Bali from Australia. And right before I got on the flight, I was notified that it was the last flight going in and coming out of, of Bali because the, the, the Nyepi New Year's Eve celebration oh, yeah. uh, was a big celebration and then followed by 24 hours of public solitude and silence where it's punishable to walk the streets. And so that's, that's not very helpful when you're, when you're trying to travel and, and get around. So uh, I showed up on this last flight and uh, there, were, there were no taxi drivers and there was no, um, you, you know, I'm trying to find a, a hostel or place to stay because my, my plan of heading north was, was, now, was now ruined. And so I'm, I'm bumbling around in, in the rain and the dark and, you know, I was so excited to be in a foreign environment in Asia and be out of my comfort zone. And then sure enough, only a couple hours in and I was just, I finally heard some other English speakers behind a wall and it was just like, ah, my goodness, English speakers, I can communicate with someone and, and <laughs> kind of, <laughs> yeah. so uh, it's one of those things where it's funny when you kind of go in, in too far into the deep end and you get uncomfortable uh, and, and you kind of crave that, that thing that you were, you're wanting to, to appreciate from the get go. But I guess you've. You've yeah, got yeah, some I can, yeah, I have an example of, you know, there's hundreds of times that happens, of course, probably to you as well. But uh, one example was I had um, slipped past the UN cordons near the Rodenzori Mountains where they're trying to keep anyone from uh, trying to go into those mountains because they were full of Hutu rebels who were meant to be genocidal. But I managed to get, slip around the UN, uh, hitchhike through the mountains, and I ended up in some small pineapple selling town uh, right in the, in the Congo Basin where the rainforest begins. And I was trying to find a guy with a motorcycle who might take me further. And my idea was he would carry me along on the motorcycle and try to find someone else who would carry me even further on the motorcycle. And the idea was I'd be passed from motorcycle to motorcycle and eventually get a thousand kilometers deep into the forest. And there's one guy, you know, there's a bunch of them crowded around me trying to, you know, uh, get my business essentially. And one guy was offering a slightly higher price than the, than the others, but he had a slightly nicer motorbike too. And I said, your, your price is slightly higher than the others. And he says, yeah, but I don't intend to just drive you around the corner and then stab you with a knife and steal your stuff. And I said, okay, fair enough, maybe I'll go with you. <laughs> and, uh, and sure enough, you know, we were, we were going deeper and deeper, and finally he's passed me off to another driver, another driver, another driver. And finally I could realize I was getting quite deep into the Congo, because I'd see people who were definitely pygmies standing at the edge of the forest. And you could even see where they were beginning to slash and burn and uh, cut into the trees. Because you know, the Chinese have built that road in to extract minerals. The um, slash and burn farmers are starting to arrive. But after a while, I arrived in the town of Apulu. 
Now, I'm completely covered in dust. I'm, like, bleeding and all that, because when you're bouncing on a motorcycle for, like, days and days and days, it's quite rough. And so I stagger toward this $4 a night hotel room that <laughs> just had, like, a, an outhouse, and essentially it was just a shack. There was a um, foreigner stepped out of the hotel. He was a Slovak guy. And I said, what? They told me there can't be any foreigners here. Anyone who uh, ventured here was supposed to be immediately killed. And he goes, yeah, that's what they told me too, but here I am. <laughs> so, so, so I said, well, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm just finished organizing my expedition to go live with the Bambooty Pygmy tribe. He said, I've got like two Nandu rangers with AK-47s as guards. I've got a uh, Pygmy to English translator. So you can't believe how hard it was to find that. I've got uh, Mustafa, this guy, he's an expert at making introductions to tribes and um, also a whole bunch of pygmies who were meant to act as the porters. And they look, they were kind of like hobbits in a way, because they're, they're quite short, and they have like backpacks made of roots and leaves, and they were meant to carry our supplies deep into the, deep into the forest. So I said, oh, I want to join your expedition. And he goes, yeah, that'd be great. It's, it's cost me $300 so far, so if you're if you, uh, willing to put 150, you can join. So for me, it's like a, a perfect example of uh, freestyle traveling because I just sort of lucked into this opportunity where all of a sudden I had no idea that I would be going deep into the forest to live with the pygmy tribe. And I had this opportunity, and because I had no planning and was just kind of mucking around doing things, I could just immediately say yes to it. And it was fantastic. You know, we, we hiked for many days. Finally, we found the Bambooty pygmy tribe, and we lived with them hunting antelope using spears and nets. That's, that's amazing. Yeah, I, I know you, you were mentioning the pygmies as well earlier, but how they were some of the happiest people that, you'd, that you had met. Yeah, they, they were so ridiculously happy. Like, uh, not all the time, of course, but when they, they really appreciated a joke. And you know this expression that you're rolling on the ground laughing? Well, regularly, like two or three times a day, the pygmies would be rolling on the ground laughing. <laughs> yeah. And they make little jokes, like they, they were finding out that I'd spent a lot of time living in the wilderness as well. So they were saying, you're a big pygmy. And then one of them thought, oh, I know, we're going to call you a uh, big me. And they thought that was so funny, so that, of course, now they have to roll on the ground laughing at that. <laughs> so, but it's kind of infectious, too. You find yourself laughing a lot more. We should definitely incorporate more of that with our, with our workplace and our family and just have good reason to roll, roll around on the ground laughing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it might be dogs. good for the health and all that. <laughs> yeah. So, obviously, this is a, you have to emplace a lot of trust really quickly. Um, I know we were talking earlier, and you were saying how your time... Uh, uh, being in total solitude for, for months on end without seeing other people, you're coming into contact with people again, and, and it, facial recognition, y you can tell right away by looking at people in, in intention, and that's helped you a lot traveling, correct? Of, of trying to uh, see if people are... Yeah, yeah, all those, all those years living in completely solitary in the wilderness really helped me. Because when, when you're living alone, I'm not sure if any of you ever tried this, but you get your first effect. Well, okay, you get a minor effect after 10 days, a bit of time distortion. But really, the first effect comes in around 24 days. And you're, you are, um, you're kind of like you're losing a habit that you don't even know you have. And that's the habit of compressing your thoughts enough that you could possibly put a word to them. So after 24 days, that starts to disappear. And instead, your thoughts go much deeper into your brain and much more evenly between the hemispheres. And after about 40 days, you get a further effect where you're sleeping and you're waking become quite similar. So it's almost like you're entering into an aboriginal dream time. Because during the daytime, you're daydreaming, but you have no actual thoughts. There's no words, there's no thoughts. You're just daydreaming, but you're doing what your daydream tells you to do. And at the end of the day, you'll find out that uh, what you needed to do was done, and now you're ready to go to sleep. But when you're asleep, you're, uh, you're also dreaming, but your dreams are real. So if you dream, like I, I used an example once, because it was, it was quite a, a spectacular one, where I dreamed that a deer had tiptoed across the mountainside eating tiger lilies. And then when I woke up in the morning, my eye noticed without surprise the missing line of tiger lilies where the, the deer had gone, because my dream was real. And then, you know, after further time in the bush, you can, you can do all sorts of fun things, like play games with deer where you sneak up on them in the gaps of their consciousness, because you can become so aware of the deer's mind that you can, in a way, like you move between its ability to, to discern <laughs> what you're doing. You can you, you wait until it's not being aware, and you can move slightly forward, and then you, you can freeze. And especially sometimes it's does a fake... Uh, time period where it's actually really aware, but it's trying to pretend it's not, and it's trying to catch you and have you move just a little bit, it would notice. But if you're aware of this, you can catch this too, and you can really fool the deer and come right up to the point of touching it. And so I used to amuse myself with that, and with my pet wasp. <laughs> I had a pet wasp that was kind of like my air force. I'd let it go all around. <laughs> and if a fly or a mosquito tried to attack me, the wasp would kill the insect. <laughs> so yeah, so it was good fun. But here's the thing though, when, when you're up that long... <laughs> 
And after a while, your, your sense of self dissolves entirely. So it'll never occur to you in the course of a day that there's even such thing as yourself. So, so whatever it is in your frontal lobe that makes the self, it turns out it's not necessary unless there's an other, so it can get shut down. And this becomes, it's very, very powerful when you're in the forest. So if you're walking along and, for instance, a bear tries to stick one eye out from behind a blackened stump 50 meters away through all these leaves, you'll immediately notice it in a tenth of a second. And it'll know that you noticed it and you can keep walking. So you're aware of every single animal. But when you come back down into civilization, you have a bunch of problems. And some of them are not so serious. One of them is your gestures are really, really wild. It's like your Italian times three. <laughs> so you have to tone that down. You have a tendency to bump into things because in the bush you don't mind if you just bang off a tree. So you've got to be careful you don't knock things down in a shop. But the, these ones are very minor. The more serious one is you can read people's minds from their face. And it's really disconcerting. It makes you feel kind of sketchy because there's so much information there. There must be like 500 times more information on someone's face or, or in the, just the way they make words or their choice of syllables or what words they picked up you know, earlier from someone else's conversation. So you, you really have deep, deep insight into other people as a result of that. And I had to, of course, tamp that down because it's, too, it, it's exhausting. You know, your brain is too active. And I think part of it is if you've been alone that long, I think maybe in an evolutionary sense, your mind might assume that perhaps you've been banished from the group or perhaps you had to move from a group to another group. So when you encounter humans again, it's hyper-aware because it could be a dangerous situation. Because you know, moving between tribes was often, you know, you could be ambushed or you could be killed if it was an enemy tribe. So you have to be really careful. But you have to, you have to work to become normal again. And it's about one for one. If you've been up six months, it takes six months of hard work to become normal again. And I, I worked to make sure I got rid of most of this bush craziness. But I kept the, the part that was sort of scanned for potential risk. Because I'd done so many uh, risky countries. And I think being able to just look at people's faces and know who I could trust and who I couldn't trust really helped me and probably kept me alive. Well, well especially, I guess, being around people that, you don't, that don't speak English and that's kind of how you're, you're getting, getting around and kind of communicating is through yeah, fa sometimes facial months, expression yeah, then and kind of that unwritten months, language of... Speaks. Yeah, so you have to... You can just look at people... You can pantomime things. You can look at people's faces. It works better. You know, if, you're, if you have to learn the local language, often you're focusing too much on the words and not enough on the face, which is the really important thing. Because what's important is not whether you can correctly ask, you know, wh where's the town you're trying to get to, but whether the person you're talking to is trying to stab you or rob you, or whether they're actually a really friendly person. And if they're friendly, then it doesn't so much matter if you're screwing up the grammar or if you're not c communicating correctly. Well, that, I guess that just shows the power of um, the, un the un unwritten language of just human, human connection. Mm -hmm. I, I know there's an example. That there, there are some cultures that... Uh, um, they don't have a word for I. So that, that's a whole different, like, shows the power of language and how it can really shape um, your thoughts, is that if, if you can't have a word for I, that kind of dissolves the ego a bit as well, because, you know, you think you can't express individuality, but instead of saying I, something like I love you, then you just say there is love. And then, and then I guess that would totally shape, shape how uh, different cultures communicate. And, or even, like you were saying, how some of, these, some of these cultures are so much more ingrained with, with nature and around them, and, and that's this kind of unwritten language of, of connection with, with nature and, and animals. Mm -hmm, that's true. And even for people who are more civilized, it can be really useful to be looking at the face and trying to find the friendly people. And I'll give an example of um, Iraq. I've been in the region of Iraq with a, a woman who wanted to go and photograph the underground party scene of Iran. And she needed someone to show up to pretend to be her fake husband so that she could more freely circulate to try to record these underground parties, which were like a form of protest against the government in a way. So I went with her for that. And it was around the time of the, the BAM earthquake. And actually, I slipped out of BAM just before the earthquake, so I was lucky to get out. But I thought, I'm so close to Iraq, I should try to get in there. And I'd met a Japanese guy who'd said that he'd managed to bribe his way across the border just to step inside very quickly to say he'd been there. And he, and he got back through, and I thought, OK, well, bribing across your way across the border might be possible. So I tried from different directions. Most of them were fail, uh, failing you know, more or less spectacularly on each one, until finally I got to Jordan. And I met a guy who was a um, refugee from Iraq who'd been living in Sweden. And he was interested to come back now that the Americans were attacking the country. He thought he might be able to come back in and see if his family was OK. So together, we hired an Iraqi guy to drive us from Amman, Jordan, to Baghdad. And it all went pretty well at the border. We had to pay a one Jordanian dinar bribe each to get across. And then we assembled into a convoy, and we were driving at incredibly fast speeds all through the night, so about 180 kilometers an hour. Because uh, 
you know, insurgents had been attacking convoys. They wanted to get things done as quickly as possible. And you can see sometimes the results of this, where sheep had tried to cross the road in the middle of the night, and it would just be carnage because the convoys can't stop. And it's a good thing that we weren't trying to drive ourselves when we had this driver, because he knew where the, the road was bombed out. You know, he could slow down and go around it. But I also knew that he was going to be trouble, because he was saying things in Arabic to the guy who was living now in Sweden, and he would translate and say, the driver has asked for 20 more dollars because of wear and tear on his tires. And I would say, well, tell him that when we negotiate a price, which we already were paying him $65, this includes any wear and tear on the tires. Like, you don't, you're not responsible for the tires if you're the passengers. So he, he would translate things like this, and you could see the driver wasn't happy. And finally, we got to the outskirts of Baghdad, and there was uh, helicopters in the air. You could hear, like, the rattle of machine gun fire in the streets, and there were still a few street lamps working. And the, the guy who was the uh, refugee was being dropped off, and he said to me, oh, are you going to be okay in Iraq? And I said, yeah, I should be. I have this guidebook. And so I sort of, he said bye to me, he was gone. And then I gestured to the driver to pull up under one of the working street lamps. And I opened up my Middle East guidebook that had like Iraq on the cover. And I find that instead of information on Iraq, there's a disclaimer. <laughs> it says, we were all too scared to go to Iraq. So we're just going to tell you that the Iraqis invented beer many thousands of years ago. They had all this like historical information. I'm like, oh no, here I am in uh, Baghdad trying to find a hotel. And all they tell me about is beer invention. So, you know, I, I had to like... Um, somehow get the driver to understand that I wanted him to show me various hotels and I'd choose one. And he was demanding $20 for the service. And I knew that's way too much. You know, I found out later $5 would be more appropriate for that. But in this case, I had to pay the $20 because in, in this blue bag here, I had probably about $80,000 in US $100 bills and I didn't want him to know that I had that. So if I was to go in and try to pull out some smaller amount of money, he might have noticed. But I did have $20 handy, so I ended up uh, giving the 20 and eventually we found a pretty good hotel where the building next to it was attacked every night. So I would sort of like sip wine from the rooftop and watch the, uh, the firefight below. But it was otherwise safe. And it was such a friendly ho hotel uh, owner. Like he was, he was trying to keep me alive because they, they all thought it was so funny that there was a Canadian tourist in their hotel. So uh, sometimes I'd be trying to come out the door and he'd come and like be pushing against my chest. He wouldn't let me out. And I'm like, ooh, okay. So I'd go and sit down on this plush little sofa he had in the, in the atrium. And then I'd hear explosions and gunfire out in the street. And I'd go, ooh, I guess they knew it was going to kick off, right? <laughs> so, but it was a really fun country. So I started from there and then I went and explored uh, Babylon, Hilla. Uh, I ended up in Tikrit by mistake because the, the guy I was hitchhiking with was a, turned out he was a big fan of Saddam Hussein. So he said, oh, here's Tikrit, Saddam Hussein's hometown. And I was thinking, ooh, I wasn't thinking of going there because I was staying alive by sort of wandering around dressed like an Iraqi and not speaking. So I can kind of pass for Arabic. And uh, luckily, no one knew I was a foreigner. But here, you know, with a, a guy pulling up to Tikrit, insisting I sit at an outdoor chicken restaurant where there's about 200 other guys you can tell from their, their headgear that they're from Saddam's tribe. And he starts talking to me in English. And they're all looking over, giving me the evil eye. And I was thinking, oh, no, are they going to come and chop off my head? And in fact, there was a Japanese guy who tried the same thing as me, same time, and he lost his head because he might have been a bit too obvious. So, you know, it was, it was important not to be noticed. But in this case, it looked like they were sort of um, disapproving that there was a foreigner, but they're not willing to kill. Maybe they didn't want to get up from their chicken. <laughs> but, but anyway, <laughs> I survived. Does anybody want to go to Iraq yet? Have we sold any, <laughs> any seats to go to Iraq yet? We've got a question here. Oh, I was, trying to, I was trying cash. to, so all through these countries, like in, in Iran, I was saying, can I put this money in a safety deposit box? No, you're a foreigner, no. And I thought, okay, when I get to the Gulf, I can put it away, because I needed that for business I was later going to do in Asia. So then I was asking in like um, Bahrain, uh, Qatar, everywhere, and they were, no, 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 unless you're a resident, you cannot bank whatsoever. And I was like, okay, I guess I got to carry it then. I mean, if you, if you can't put it anywhere, you have to carry it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sure you've paid a fair amount of bribes, even just the, the, the traveling that I've done. Sometimes you realize that bribing is a part of life for a lot of these countries. Um, and it can also be a lot more of an efficient way to cut through a bureaucracy of just uh, mm -hmm. paying to try and get through. Uh, I know I've had a, a bribe uh, uh, to get into Honduras. Um, you, if, you, if you don't have proof of yellow fever certificate, which isn't normally something that you carry on you, um, the guy will kind of point at you and just kind of wait with his fingers dapping on the desk until you, until you realize that he's just lo looking for 20 bucks or something like that. But do you have any other examples of ridiculous bribes that you've had to pay to get okay, into but, countries? Okay, or? before I get to ridiculous bribes, though, you can actually get your yellow fever for like 10 bucks in Lima. 
right and Peru. Yeah. In yeah, the airport, so, I've I've yeah, I've seen so, that before. They, yeah, they, so, they know that you have to get that. Then once you have Peru. it, that'd be really important when you do Africa because they ask for that all the time. And in fact, in Africa, they ask for things you can't really have. Like they they say, "Where's your smallpox uh, vaccination certificate?" And Anything. Yeah, right? And Anything you know when they're asking that, they're really they're they're asking for a bribe. But sometimes it gets really bad. And the, the worst for police corruption in Africa anyway is centered around the DRC. So the closer you are to the DRC, the more corruption. And, uh, Congo? Near, yeah, so here's an example. Like in the Republic of Congo, which is just north of there, there was one situation where I arrived in a town and I saw that policemen were beating each other bloody. Like the blood was streaming down their faces. They pound each other in the face. And the, this melee goes on for like five minutes. And finally, a local tells me, they're fighting over who has the right to try to extort $10 out of you. And I thought, okay, I don't normally pay a bribe, but in this case, whoever wins, I'm just going to give them the $10. <laughs> 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 yeah. And a funny thing happened in the same town. Then, like, after the policeman got his $10, he said, oh, there's a white man in town. Probably you know him. And I'm like, and I just arrived in the country, right? And I, and I thought, okay, that's pretty funny that he would assume that I would know him. And then I walked over and looked, and I go, hey, I know you. <laughs> so... so He's a guy I'd met in Mauritania, who'd been uh, like on his bike, and we chatted for, for five minutes or so four months before. Yeah. <laughs> so, so no needless to say, you're, you're not a traditional traveler in, in any sense going through these countries. And, uh, and, and same thing with the things that you carry with you. You're a minimalist, and you don't bring uh, a camera with you just for those exact reasons, correct? Yeah, a camera can be a lot of trouble. You can get killed for your camera. Or phones, you know, I don't use those either. Or uh, really, I just carry some... I carried my notebooks, and even in those, I, I developed kind of a scrawl instead of a proper way of writing, because you get secret police or police so often confiscate your notebooks, and they're trying to find something criminal in there. But if you write in such a way that they can't even understand it, then you can just make up whatever you want for what it says there. Because sometimes you might have written, made a, um, a note that might have reflected poorly on the local police or the country, who knows, right? It's better to, to stay safe by making a kind of a code. And other than that, just some dirty old clothes. And then if I had to do business and I, I had no way to hide the money anywhere, I guess I'd be carrying the money. But I'd make sure I look as shabby as possible so no one would think that I had that. Hmm. Well, let's, let's shift over to food here because I know traveling, um, a lot of times you have to uh, eat something that you wouldn't normally eat or uh, different delicacies and things um, that a, a, a host might want to uh, provide for you. So I'm, I'm sure you've got a fair share of uh, some pretty strange things that you've You've, had, you've eaten over the years and okay, over the I'll, Okay, I'll tell one and then you tell one because okay. you probably had a lot of strange <laughs> <laughs> food as well. But there, there's one time I was in the restricted military zone in the far west of Mongolia and I'd rented a yurt and a horse for $10 a day. And I would just go out and ride like 70 kilometers here or there. And I'm, I'm actually not a very good horse rider but I had like a, a very tough bum from like sitting on third world buses. So I could actually outride the Mongolians. Term, like my skill was poor, but you know, they would be like begging to get off the horse and I'd be like, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, but, but when I first arrived, I bought a sheep to give to the neighboring yurt, just as sort of a welcoming sheep. And then like a few days later, they invite, like an old man came over and invited me over to his yurt. And I opened it up and I could see by candlelight that everyone's sitting by this circular table in the middle of the yurt. And the head of the sheep that I had given them as a gift was there cooked in the middle of the table. And I'm like, ooh, okay, that's kind of weird food. And then, like, the old man gestures that I'm to sit down beside him. And the whole family sitting seated around there. And he started cutting out weird things from the sheep. And then I was expected to eat them. So, like, he'd chop out an eyeball. And I had to gobble it. And it tastes like what you'd expect. It tastes like an eyeball. Like, what you can imagine. Like, slithering jellies and, like, really <laughs> quite disgusting. But then, so, so this was, like, already a little bit bad. But then he gives me this local a shot of local vodka, really, really rank stuff, and I'm supposed to down it. And then he kept cutting off strange parts of the head, like bits of brain or lips or things, and after each one, I had to do a shot of vodka. And I was thinking, oh, I wonder if I, I get sick here, and you know, that would be kind of a faux pas. But uh, luckily, I was able to hold the stuff down and make it back to my yurt. And, uh, so. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm fortunate I've uh, stayed clear of uh, sheep, sheep, sheep sets, but uh, um, I guess... You know, traveling uh, in, in Laos, they have their, the rattlesnake whiskey, which is the common thing. So they've got the rattlesnake coiled up into the bottle, and uh, which is, you know, you do a shot of that, and it's definitely, there's some, some, some flaky sediment of some skin and, and some <laughs> things floating around. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite parts of uh, stories of interesting foods to eat was uh, going uh, an overnight boat to Koh Phangan in, uh, in Thailand. And uh, the only food stand that was nearby where this... this boat was taking off was full of insects 
and uh, which, as some people might realize, is a, an amazing source of protein in a very cheap and efficient way, thousands of times over from uh, raising cattle or something. But um, so they had an, an assortment of uh, fried crickets and fried cockroaches and and different uh, silkworms and things. Uh, so there we were trying trying these things. The, the cockroaches were a little little chewy, but uh, the, the the crickets were actually quite quite delicious with the salty soy spray that you put on them. So mm. I think you, you've tried more insects than me then, because I, I was once down with a friend from British Columbia, and we were in uh, Thailand, and he went and bought some of those scorpions that they deep fry, and he eats one. And I said, so how was it? And he said, really bad, actually. <laughs> I didn't like it. <laughs> so, and I was hearing this from a lot of people that ate the insects, so I, I didn't really... I mean, I tried the, the squished up water bug they put in their sauce, but um, yeah, other than that, I, I didn't do as many insects as you. <laughs> Yeah, the, I've tried the scorpion as well, but normally they fry them so much that it's just a, uh, just crispy soy that's all you yeah, taste. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> what he said about it as well, so I thought I wouldn't give it a go. <laughs> um, let's, let's talk now about um, no, all the countries that you've been to. Um, do you have an added appreciation for when you come back to a Western country? Because um, I know for myself, living even just in Central America or, or being in Asia, uh, the, the luxury of drinking tap water and flushing toilet paper gets me giddy every time I come back home. <laughs> Every time you flush, you're like, "Woo!" <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> Drinking tap water is like, I can't believe we're getting away with this. And people drink bottled water at, ho at home here, it's, which is ridiculous. Um, but uh, tell us a, a bit about uh, so, uh, for, some of your for appreciations. Me, for, yeah, for, for me, I'm not sure I can feel the same way because I get a little bit bored. So if I, you know, I don't, I don't know if I could live in a place like Canada because everything works too well. <laughs> so <laughs> that's why I was just off in Ukraine because there things are a little bit messed up and there's more interesting stuff going on. So, uh, yeah, I think it, it suits me better, things a little bit wilder. <laughs> so do you have any advice for anyone that's attempting to travel to every country in the world? Okay, well, I'd say work on your... Um, instead of being angry when someone's trying to rip you off, because they always are. So you, you meet so many people that are trying to rip you off, like they're trying to sell you a mango for 10 times what the price should be. Well, instead of being angry at that, look at it as a learning opportunity, because within the inflection of their voice or on their face is the information that reveals how much they're ripping you off. And you can imagine if you were in a business school and you were trying to pay to get this skill to know if, if someone's being uh, truthful with you or not, you probably have to pay $100,000 to have that kind of course if they could even offer it. But by traveling, since you get a constant prey to people trying to rip you off, you can look at that as an excellent uh, schooling opportunity. And you're, you're, you're wondering and trying to guess. And later when you find the price, you see if your intuition was in accord with what the reality was or not. And then you adjust what you're paying attention to accordingly. And at the end of that, you can get a, a really good ability to read people. And it can be uh, good for business life as well. There we go. Yeah, so it's an opportunity. So instead of being angry about being ripped off by the locals, you can use it as a training opportunity. Mm -hmm. I know I've, I've learned a lot from, uh, especially in Peru, I find that's a culture that people are just extra connected with, with nature and things around there. And one of my favorite uh, stories um, from being down there, we w went up to Machu Picchu with the local medicine man, which we were happy to get more of the local insight in Machu Picchu instead of going with the typical tourist group where that you'd learn more so about the, uh, the, the guy, the American guy that found it rather than why the people built it in the first place. But being with uh, a, a local medicine man, he was giving some really cool information about Machu Picchu and uh, talking about cosmo uh, the cosmos and how they, they built it, and they built it in the fourth dimension, which I found really fast. And I originally thought that was um, because it's... Uh, different levels and different, you know, I was thinking more of the space, but then I later found out that the, he was talking the fourth dimension because it was discussing that they were c so connected with nature, they could speak with the rocks, that that was the fourth dimension, was having that extra connect connectedness, and that they could speak with the rocks, know where to cut, and build these things that were impossible to build otherwise because they were so connected. And so that was kind of one of those mind-blowing moments, and you're kind of sitting there, and you're... you're he was speaking in Spanish, which I was trying to make sure I was translating things correctly. So I, I asked him, I go, okay, so how do you get into the fourth dimension? And, and he kind of looked and he paused. And he gave me a, a perfect answer for a question that is really impossible to answer. But he looked at me and said, okay, to get into the fourth dimension, you open your heart and you observe. And for me, that's, that's been one of the most valuable lessons that I've, that I've learned of... of especially with traveling in general, if you go with an open heart and you can just observe, you can learn so much and maybe you can even tap into that, that fourth dimension as well. Mm -hmm. So, advice. But uh, uh, do we have any questions from the crowd here? We, we're running a little bit short on time, but does anyone have any questions right here? Mm. 
The, the question is losing losing the ability for words, living so much in solitude that you're kind of uh, you, you lose that that ego of language. Yeah, well, well, even today, I think it's permanently changed my mind because you know how like uh, some people think in words and some people think in pictures. Well, I don't think in anything now, so my mind is completely blank. And and even if someone was to look and they say, "Oh, what are you doing now?" I would try to pull up what I might have been doing, but it's going to be seven or eight things at once, and it's just fragments of it, and then it'll dissolve again. And, uh, and also, if I'm working on something very difficult, what I'm actually doing is, uh, in a way, moving the center of my attention between two areas of my brain that my intuition tells me there's something there, but everything's still blank. And at the end of it, I'll have the solution to what I was working on. So I think you know, all that solitude time has maybe made a, a permanent shift in my thought patterns. Some, okay, sometimes I was writing. So some of the time when I went up alone, I was writing. And sometimes I was just enjoying nature. Because you can just watch butterflies, you know, dancing around or, or watch squirrels. And sometimes you can watch squirrels and just stand there completely still. And then you can fool them into thinking you're a tree. And they'll come and spiral up your body. And it's happened to me on three occasions where they've come right to my face and they're like chirping at each other. And I'll kind of move my eyes and they're like, oh no, <laughs> I'm on a person, not a tree. And then you can see them go, you away. And, uh, you know, at that point, they'll stay quiet for five minutes or ten minutes, which is a lot for squirrels in mating season. You know, they'll be so there, worried about their mistake. There we have some zen from the world's most traveled man, Mike spencer Bound. Give your hand round of applause. His, his book is not out for a few more weeks, but we have some copies here. It's The World's Most Traveled Man. My name is John Early, a local author here. My book is Tales of the Modern Nomad, Monks, Mushrooms, and Other Misadventures. And uh, thank you everyone so much for, for being here and to Word on the Street for valuing words, poetry, uh, books, and, and the spoken word right here on, on Broadway. So thank you guys so, so much. Mm -hmm.